This is a unit for special forces, not for boys who want own special cars. Welcome back, Autobots, the Decepticons, and everything in between to another Transformers theory. Today's we're going to dive into the intriguing history of the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty, better known by its acronym NEST. For those who may not remember, NEST was the military organization that assisted the Autobots in their fight against the Decepticons during the events of Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon. Since there is a ton of lore about NEST, I will be creating a timeline of events from its founding to its termination as well as its subsequent reactivation. To do this, I will be using information the films give us in addition to some of the info the tie-in movie comics provide. Though much of the information from them are no longer canon due to Age of Extinction and The Last Night screwing up their timeline, I will be using significant dates from them and plausible events that I feel would logically line up within the Bavers in order to help flesh out this timeline. And for those of you who want a deeper understanding of Nest's backstory, I highly recommend checking out my video on Sector 7, as this video builds directly off of that one. So without further ado, let's jump right in and uncover the history of Nest. Our timeline begins on June 2007. After the Decepticons' tirade was stopped thanks to the combined effort of the United States military and the Autobots, the government was deeply disappointed with Sector 7's inability to prevent the Decepticons' attack on Los Angeles. In an effort to keep the incident under wraps, President George W. Bush ordered the directive to terminate Sector 7 and discreetly dispose of the remains of the fallen Decepticons in the depths of the Laurentian Abyss. This order was carried out effectively, and in July of 2007, Megatron and the boys were now resting at the bottom of the sea. Now before I continue with the timeline, I would like to address how I exactly got the dumping date for the Decepticons. The date comes courtesy of the Revenge of the Fallen movie prequel comic Alliance. In it, the comic states that the Battle of Los Angeles happened a month before the Decepticons were dumped. We know that the 2007 movie takes place in June 2007, since Sam Witwicky just completed his junior year of high school, and 2007 being the year the film takes place is backed up by George W. Bush being president. With that info in mind, this would place July being the month when the Decepticons were laid to rest at the bottom of the Laurentian Abyss. So with that information squared off, let's get back to the timeline. Now, minutes before the Decepticons were dunked into the ocean, William Lennox found himself at odds with some of his superiors at the Pentagon. These officials lacking trust in the Autobots opposed Lennox's idea for a joint military alliance. They made it clear that before they would provide full support for the alliance, Lennox must first secure the complete cooperation of the Autobots. This task was now firmly placed on the shoulders of the young officer, who would have to take the responsibility for making the alliance a reality. Now, the reasoning behind Lennox's desire to form an alliance with the Autobots is not directly stated in the films or comics. However, it can be inferred that as one of the first individuals to witness the destructive capabilities of the Decepticons, he understood the urgent need for a powerful ally in the fight against them. Lennox's first-hand experience in battle alongside the Autobots not only showed him the effectiveness of a human-Autobot alliance against the Decepticons, but it also revealed the Autobots' unwavering commitment to protect humanity even if it meant sacrificing their own lives. I believe this realization was the reason why Lennox was so determined to create an alliance with the Autobots. And as we know, his determination paid off since when Revenge of the Fallen rolls around, Nest is in full swing, countering Decepticon incursions all across the globe, with several new Autobots by their side. They now have a global headquarters station on the island of Diego Garcia, and this new guy named Morshower is in charge? Whoa. Let's step back a bit and figure out how we got from this to this. And well, a good place to start is with the Revenge of the Fallen movie. Though it does not give us much information on how Ness progressed throughout the years, we do get this nugget of information. With all due respect, we've been fighting side by side in the field for two years. This would mean that Nest was officially founded sometime in 2007, likely in July since that's when Lennox proposed the idea of a military alliance between the United States and the Autobots, which Optimus agreed to. With the assurance of the Autobots' full cooperation, the Pentagon approved the alliance, and the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty was formed. At this time, General Glenn Morshauer, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military, would have taken on the role as the organization's leader. 
future. As for why Nest was stationed on the island of Diego Garcia, it was probably done to keep the presence of giant transforming robots a secret. The government would also go on to request that the last known remaining piece of the AllSpark would be placed under human protection at Diego Garcia in a Shakir electromagnetic vault. Now, another thing that likely happened as soon as this alliance was formed was the passing of the Alien Autobot Cooperation Act. This piece of legislation was crafted and passed in secret, in order to keep the public unaware of the government's partnership with autonomous robotic organisms. This agreement was made between the United States and the Autobots, in which the Autobots would provide intelligence and protection from the Decepticons in exchange for a safe haven on Earth. Under the agreement, full and equal information sharing was to be implemented by both sides. As NES became more multinational, the terms of the agreement extended to its members. Now, the last thing to take note of that happened during this time is Optimus Prime's speech. As we know, at the end of the 2007 movie, Prime sends out a signal across space in an effort to locate any surviving Autobots. Upon watching the film, you would think that message was sent out on top of this hill. However, we later learn that the message was actually sent out at Nest, allowing for Skids, Mudflap, Sideswipe, Jolt RC, Alita 1, and Chromia to come to Earth. From this point on, up until the events of Revenge of the Fallen, Nest would work closely with the Autobots in order to counter various Decepticon threats. During this time, the group became multinational, operating within foreign borders in order to contain and neutralize Decepticon incursions. Some of the personnel that made up Nest at this time was the majority of the Qatar Ranger team, those members being Captain William Lennox, the founder of Nest, his right-hand man, Technical Sergeant Robert Epps, and last but not least, Burke. As for some other personnel, there were a ton of British Army soldiers who served in Nest. This makes sense since the island of Diego Garcia stationed joint military bases for both the United Kingdom and United States. The only British soldier we got a name for was Agent Graham who was part of the Special Air Services Forces. Now, something to note here is that in real life, there's no such UK military unit known as the Special Air Services Forces. The SASF is likely a fictionalized version of the real Special Air Services, which is an elite unit of the United Kingdom's army. This can explain why Graham is designated as an agent despite the fact that the SAS refers to their soldiers as troopers. As for some other personnel that joined Nest at this time, the only ones known by name would be Stone and Mongo. From here, we finally get to the events of Revenge of the Fallen, which takes place in September 2009. We know that the film takes place in 2009 since Barack Obama is president. And we know it's the month of September since Sam is starting his first year of college at Princeton University. And classes at Princeton typically begin during the first or second week of September. During the events of Revenge of the Fallen, Nest arrived in Shanghai with a cover story provided by the Chinese government that they were cleaning up a toxic spill in the industrial area. In reality, the Autobot Human Military Alliance was hunting down the sixth group of Decepticon infiltrators detected in the past eight months, with the hopes of cleanly taking out the enemy without members of the public witnessing the secret war. During the mission to Shanghai, Morshauer authorized Nest to deploy once he learned that the Chinese had sealed off the airspace around the suspected zone. It did not take long to confirm a Decepticon presence, but said Decepticon started things off with a bang forcing Epps to request air assistance. The Decepticons, Demolisher, and Sideways wrecked a significant portion of Shanghai before they were defeated. Following the events in Shanghai, President Obama dispatched his national security advisor, Theodore Galloway, to Diego Garcia in order to outline the White House's criticisms of Nest operations and their alliance with the Autobots. When Galloway got to Nest, he pointed out that the administration feared that the reason why the Decepticons continued to stay and come to Earth was to seek vengeance upon the Autobots. Galloway would go on to grill optimists on why he refused to share information on Cybertronian weapon technology with the United States military when the alien Autobot Cooperation Act was being drafted. Optimus made it clear that he was well aware of humanity's less than stellar performance in regards to peace, stating that sharing their technology would absolutely do more harm than good. Galloway would take issue with Prime's claim considering that the Autobots and Decepticons had destroyed their own planet. Captain Lennox, who was now promoted to Major, and Technical Sergeant Epps, who was now promoted to Master Sergeant, attempted to defend Optimus's claims, but Galloway made it quite clear that he did not care what they had to say. Chairman Morshauer had better success in getting Galloway to show some respect, saying that he found Lennox and Epps beyond reproach. But Galloway informed Morshauer that with regards to national security, the president felt that no one was above reproach. The security advisor would then directly ask Optimus that if the president felt that the United States' national security was better served by having the Autobots leave Earth, would they do so peacefully? Optimus Prime agreed, saying that freedom was their right. 
However, he told Galloway to pass a message along to the president. That message being, what if the Autobots left and the government was wrong? Unbeknownst to everyone during this conversation, the Decepticon communications officer Soundwave had been silently listening in, gathering crucial information such as Megatron's whereabouts in the Laurentian Abyss and the location of the last Allspark fragment, which was being kept in a secure vault at Diego Garcia. Taking swift action, Soundwave dispatched Ravage and Reedman to steal the fragment. The mission resulted in the loss of several Brave Ness soldiers, further straining relationships between the United States and the Autobots. With the shard in hand, Soundwave sent the Constructicons to the Laurentian Abyss, and Scapel used the shard to revive their fallen leader. Finally, back in action, Megatron would set his sights on capturing Sam Witwicky. The Autobots would soon send word to Nest of multiple incoming Decepticons, but refused to specify where they were heading and would not respond to Nest's calls. Lennox ordered Nest to be ready for deployment in 20 minutes, but by the time they made it to the US, Lennox received a message from the Autobots. The battle with the Decepticons to rescue Sam Witwicky had not gone well, and Optimus Prime was dead. In the wake of this devastating loss, the Decepticons under the leadership of Megatron's master, The Fallen, launched an onslaught of bolder and more destructive attacks across the world. The Fallen would go on to make a broadcast revealing the Transformers' presence on Earth, demanding that Sam Witwicky be turned over to them or Earth would be destroyed. Among the casualties were Paris, France, and the USS Theodore Roosevelt. In the midst of this crisis, President Obama was flown to a secure bunker somewhere in the middle of the United States. Horrified by the loss of over 7,000 lives, including American sailors, Obama knew that immediate action was needed, and so he called on General Morshauer to lead the charge in coordinating a national response. With Morshauer focused on forming a strategy, someone was needed to take the reins of Nest, and so President Obama appointed Theodore Galloway, giving him operational control of the unit. Sometime after Optimus Prime's death, his body would be brought to an Air Force base in New Jersey. Before his body had barely hit the ground, the United States military surrounded the Autobots. Lennox ordered the soldiers to lower their weapons, only to learn that Director Galloway was now in charge of Nest. With his newfound power, Galloway used the broadcast and the attacks as an excuse to have Ness deactivated, ordering Lennox to have his team and the Autobots cease all Decepticon operations and return to Diego Garcia pending further orders. Lennox tried to argue the importance of the Autobots in a fight against the Decepticons, but Galloway dismissed his arguments, stating that they needed to focus on a coordinated US military strategy. He also revealed that while battle plans were being drawn up, they were exploring every diplomatic solution, including the possibility of handing over Sam to the Decepticons. As a final insult, Galloway stripped a badge off of Lennox's uniform. As the Autobots were being loaded onto C-17s for transport back to Diego Garcia, Lennox received a phone call from none other than former Sector 7 agent Seymour Simmons who said that he was with Sam and needed Optimus brought to Egypt since Sam figured out a way to revive him. Lennox found it strange but realized that Sam had a better idea of the stakes and decided to trust him. However, there was a problem. That problem was Director Theodore Galloway. If he got wind of this plan to go to Egypt, there would be no hope in resurrecting Optimus. To counteract this, Lennox notified his soldiers on the new plan and made arrangements with the pilots of the C-17s returning the Autobots to drop them off in Egypt. Mid-flight, Lennox had the pilots fake some engine trouble. Galloway began to suspect that Lennox might have something to do with this, and warned that it would be the death of his career. However, when the plane banked sharply to the left, he realized that there was something wrong, and began to visibly panic as his parachute was strapped on. Lennox then tricked the director into opening the parachute while they were still on the plane, pulling him out and removing Galloway as an obstacle. Lennox then had a message with the coordinates to where they were landing sent to General Morshauer including a warning to get ready to bring the rain. Upon receiving this message, Morshauer recognized that Lennox had a better idea of what was going on than their national security advisor, and told his men to be prepared to back Nest up if it came to a fight. Eventually, Nest parachuted into Egypt, landing in a village. Lennox would order Nest to be ready for combat, and once Agent Graham had a visual on Yellow Team, Lennox ordered a flare to be popped so Sam and friends could find them. Unfortunately, this flare also got the attention of Starscream, who began attacking the incoming Autobots and released an electromagnetic pulse to disable Nest's communications, while Soundwave knocked out the United States' military satellite coverage. Once communications were out, Megatron ordered the Decepticons to attack, with a small force leading to engage Nest. 
As this was going down, Morshower tried to get in contact with Lennox and his team, but because of the EMP, it was impossible. However, by some miracle, he was able to get a phone call from the National Security Advisor. You see, after Galloway pulled his chute, he somehow ended up finding some locals and tried to ask them where he was, only for them to believe that he was saying that he was in the United States. Galloway then called General Morshower and demanded to know where he was. Morshower hung up on Galloway without so much as a goodbye. Although he would have been amused by Galloway's predicament. Morshower was concerned that Galloway could contact them while Lennox and his team could not. Heading to Nest's control room, Morshower learned that they couldn't establish contact with Nest. He also learned that something had blinded all their satellites above the area. Morshower ordered his men to contact Egypt and Jordan to deploy some air assets to locate Nest. Once they saw the war that was raging on, Morshower ordered every available armed unit to the region, thus sparking Operation Firestorm. On the ground, Ness fought a desperate struggle to hold off the Decepticons, until Sam arrived with the Matrix of Leadership. Once Sam Witwicky and Michaela Baines were with them, Sergeant Epps ordered in an airstrike, which managed to destroy most of the Decepticon forces. With the coast clear, Sam was able to use the Matrix to bring Optimus back to life. And with the Autobot leader functioning once again, Nest watched as he combined with Jetfire and subsequently defeated the Fallen, forcing Megatron and the remaining Decepticons to retreat. And thus, the world was once again saved by a human-autobot alliance. From here, we now move on to the events between Revenge of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon. And this is where a lot of interesting developments take place. As we know, at the end of the film, Optimus Prime sends out a transmission into space, detailing recent events so that the past of both human and Cybertronian races would be remembered, declaring that humanity and the Autobots would face the future together. This message, just like the first, was vetted at Nest. And, as we know, it would go on to attract some more Autobots, specifically the ones aboard the Xanthium. Those being the Autobot Engineers, Leadfoot, Roadbuster, and Topspin, the Autobot Inventor, Wheeljack, and the Autobot Warrior, Mirage. The ship would later be based at the Kennedy Space Center so the United States government could study and maintain military control over it. The Wreckers were responsible for maintaining the craft while it was grounded, and would spend most of their time working on it and repairing it with the help of some human engineers. However, the trio was rarely let off the base due to their attitude. Another event that happened shortly after the events of Revenge of the Fallen was Theodore Galloway's rescue. Though we never get to see it play out on screen, we know it happened since the government wouldn't just abandon their national security visor in the middle of nowhere. And the comics back this up since he goes on to appear in several stories that take place after the events of Revenge of the Fallen. Some other events that took place during this time would be the public's reaction to aliens living among them and working with the government. After the Fallen's hack, the secret was out. And there was no way Ness could cover this one up, especially after the global mess that the Decepticons made. The extent of what the public knew at this time is not fully known. However, by the time Dark of the Moon takes place, the public is well aware of who the Autobots and Decepticons are, in addition to key players from each faction. Former Special Agent Seymour Simmons would capitalize off of this by going on to write the best-selling book, Codename Hero, How Seymour Simmons and the Aliens Saved the World, which covered his experiences as a Sector 7 agent and how he fought the Decepticons. However, public perception of the Autobots wasn't really high, and by the time Dark of the Moon takes place, half the world would feel safer with the Autobots completely gone. To counteract the fear of Transformers, Nest invented Energon detectors and set them up around the globe. They were stationary installments designed to detect Energon signatures of Cybertronians, and were heavily used by Nest as a means of locating and tracking the Decepticons. Speaking of the Decepticons, they haven't been seen much if at all ever since Operation Firestorm. With a distinct lack of Decepticon threats, Ness began to get involved in policing human affairs across the globe, ever since the Autobots became fully sanctioned members of the United States military. During this time, Ness's global headquarters would be moved from Diego Garcia to Washington, D.C. It would also be disguised as a Department of Health and Human Services building in order to fool outsiders. During this time, a ton of new recruits joined Ness after the organization was declassified to the public welcoming those who wanted to fight giant alien robots with open arms. The only recruits we know by name would be Mark L, Hardcore Eddie, Zimmerman, and Hooch. During this time, Lennox would be promoted from Major to Colonel. As for Epps, on the other hand, at some point after Operation Firestorm, he would retire from being a soldier due to him wanting a break from aliens shooting at him. He would subsequently be offered a position working on the Xanthium at the Kennedy Space Center. And with all that squared off, we now finally get to the events of Transformers Dark of 
of the Moon, which takes place in the September of 2013. We know that Dark of the Moon takes place in 2013 since Sam just finished up his four-year degree in geopolitics, with him graduating from Princeton during the last week of May. We also know that Sam has been job hunting for three months due to a line Ron Witwicky says. Three months out of school and he can't find a job? So with that said, Dark of the Moon logically takes place around September 2013. During the events of Dark of the Moon, Ness sent out an Autobot strike team composed up of Bumblebee, Sideswipe, Mirage, and Wheeljack to destroy an illegal nuclear facility in the Middle East. As this was going down, a tip from Alexei Voshkod, the general counsel for the Ukrainian Department of Energy, sent Lennox's team to the abandoned Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The Nest team proceeded inside the power plant and within they located some sort of alien device. However, before they could secure it, they were attacked by Shockwave's pet driller which made off with the device. Lennox and his team evacuated the building and outside joined Optimus Prime in fighting off Shockwave and the driller. After regaining possession of the device, Optimus told Lennox that it was an engine in part from a long-lost Autobot ship. With the device in hand, they returned to Nest Headquarters, where Autobot and human members alike were training to take down Decepticons. Lennox would get a visit from the Director of National Intelligence, Charlotte Mearing, who wanted to compile some information on the recent Nest raid in Iran. Upon her arrival, Optimus demanded answers about why he wasn't told that Autobot technology was at one point being used at Chernobyl. Mearing would go on to explain that the reason why this information wasn't shared with the bots was because it was deemed to be director-only clearance at Sector 7 until now. She would then introduce Buzz Aldrin and two of NASA's founding directors to him. They revealed to Prime that Umandi had discovered the ruins of the Ark on the Moon in the 1960s. With this knowledge in hand, Prime traveled to the Moon with Ratchet aboard the Xanthium, where they discovered the body of Sentinel Prime within the Ark's crash vault, along with a small fraction of the special cargo the Ark had been carrying five pillars capable of opening a space bridge. Upon their return to Earth, Mearing ordered that the pillars be locked up until Nesta knew what they were capable of. Swiftly after this, Sam Witwicky and his new girlfriend Carly Spencer arrived at the gate. Though the pair were stopped by the guards, Bumblebee let them in and Sam passed on information he had gained about the Decepticons' involvement in the space race. Upon using the Matrix of Leadership, Optimus revived Sentinel, who explained that the pillars were a transportation device and demanded that they be returned to the Autobots. Mearing, however, believed that the pillars' potential to be used as weapons of mass destruction was too great and decided to keep them locked up, a decision Sentinel wasn't too keen on. After this, Mearing had a conversation with Sam and Carly to address Sam's desire of wanting to join Nest. However, she would explain to him that Nest was a unit for veteran intelligence officers and special forces, not for boys who once owned special cars. However, she told him that she appreciated what he did for them. She would then send Nest agents to Sam's office as a result of the recent Decepticon attack, in addition to sending him home with Autobot protection. Sam would soon after get in contact with Seymour Simmons, and the two would discover evidence that the Decepticons held hundreds of the same pillars Sentinel had. Fearing that the cons would soon be coming after Sentinel Prime since he was the only one who could activate the pillars, Sam alerted Mearing and she would put Nest on high alert. Several Autobots escorted Sentinel Prime safely back to Nest headquarters, while fending off a team of Decepticons along the way. But once they had arrived at their destination, Sentinel allowed his facade to drop, revealing that he had a centuries-long alliance with Megatron. He then killed Ironhide with his Cosmic Rust Cannon, and tore the Nest base apart in order to reclaim the pillars. Mearing tried to confront Sentinel as he rampaged through Nest. However, there was nothing she could do to stop him. When Optimus eventually rolled up on the scene, she told him that this was all his fault, and would subsequently apologize to Sam for underestimating him. Eventually, Sentinel Prime met up with his Decepticon co-conspirators at the Lincoln Memorial. There, Sentinel opened up a small space bridge, through which Decepticon troops waiting on the moon poured into DC. The Autobots and Ness were overpowered by the sheer amount of Decepticons and retreated after Optimus told them to do so. After retreating to the safety of the Pentagon, on, Nest would learn from Morshower that combat commands were now at DEFCON 1. Lennox would subsequently explain that approximately 200 Decepticons were now in hiding, and that Energon detectors have been triggered as far as South America and China. Nest forces would then receive a message from Sentinel Prime, stating that he and the Decepticons would harmlessly take the resources they needed from Earth in order to rebuild Cybertron, and depart with no further bloodshed if Optimus and his Autobot rebels were exiled from the planet hoping that the military would get more time to make a coordinated attack against the Decepticons if they cooperated with them by exiling the bots. Congress swiftly passed legislation to exile the bots from American shores, putting an end to the Alien Autobot Cooperation Act. 
As a result, the Autobots would be taken down to the Kendi Space Center in order to be exiled. As the Ness personnel and the Wreckers prepared to ship for launch, Sam got a chance to catch up with Epps while Simmons butted heads with Mearing about how exiling the bots was a terrible idea. After the Autobots made their final goodbyes, the Xanthium successfully lifted off from the Kendi Space Center, but it would soon be shot down by Starscream. In the event's aftermath, Epps heard that Sam was planning on rescuing his girlfriend from Dylan Gold, the Decepticon liaison, and thanks to the help of Simmons and Dutch, they were able to figure out that he was holding her captive in a penthouse in Trump Tower. Wanting to get the guy who helped to murder the Autobots, Epps decided to go with Sam, and gathered a few friends he had worked with at Nest. After packing up their things, they would head to Chicago. Seno Prime, believing that the Autobots were destroyed, commanded Megatron and the Decepticons to conquer Chicago and begin placing pillars in key locations worldwide. Following the attack on Chicago, Lennox went to Grissom Air Force Base to coordinate an attack, networking with Morshower and Demiring by video. Morshower reported that their high-altitude bombers had been taken out and all their satellite communication had been jammed leaving them without the ability to track the enemy's movements. Mearing added that their drones were also being shot down. Despite these challenges, Morshower proposed a bold solution, deploying small stealthy drones into the city to gather crucial intelligence. Simmons interjected, saying that whoever was manning these UAV drones should redirect them towards Trump Tower since that's where Sam was heading to save Carly from Dylan. When the gang arrived at the Decepticon-controlled Chicago, Epps was overwhelmed by the destruction and believed that rescuing Carly would be impossible. He attempted to convince Sam that they did not stand a chance, but just as they were about to give up hope, they were attacked by a Decepticon fighter, but the team was saved when Optimus Prime and the Wreckers showed up on the scene. As the rest of the Autobots arrived, they revealed that they had known that the Decepticons would never leave Earth alone, and so they had hidden a booster rocket that disengaged before the ship was destroyed. Now having a fighting chance with the Autobots' help, they infiltrated the city and successfully rescued Carly. After Carly was saved, Epps managed to get a message to the Pentagon through a crashed military drone. Carly was able to explain that the Decepticons were planning to use the pillars to bring Cybertron into Earth's atmosphere. Epps and the gang came up with a plan to destroy the control pillar with a rocket shot from a high building. Before Sam and the other humans left, Wheeljack handed out grappling gloves and boomsticks to aid them in combat. At this time, the Pentagon was doing everything they could to get more visuals on Chicago by attempting to access any cameras still operational in the city. Lennox would then organize a Nest team to enter the embattled city, and when he asked for volunteers to fly with him into a Decepticon-occupied Chicago, everyone was ready to do what was necessary to save the city. They traveled by Osprey to get to Chicago, but once they started to take fire, the Nest soldiers had to use a combination of wingsuits and parachutes in order to get to the ground safely. As this was going down, Epson and the others made it into a tall building. When they were about to shoot down the control pillar, Decepticon fighters began firing at the skyscraper, causing it to tilt. When a Decepticon protoform came in looking for them, the group escaped by jumping out of the window and sliding down to a lower floor. After they were discovered by Shockwave, he would send his pet driller to finish the building. Epps and the others were able to narrowly escape as Optimus arrived to put down the driller. The group began rushing towards the building with the pillars which had started to activate but Epps and his men were separated from Sam and Carly when Starscream took several pot shots at them. Starscream would go on to attempt to squish Sam, but Sam was able to fight back, using the grapple glove to launch onto the robot's eye, and jamming the boomstick in the other, fully blinding him. Lennox and his squad was alerted to the commotion, and started to open fire. Lennox was able to cut Sam free before the bomb in Starscream's head exploded. As they fell, Bumblebee was able to catch them in the nick of time. Back at the Pentagon, the military started to send tomahawks to the city. Dutch was able to hack into the traffic camera for the Michigan Avenue Bridge, and was able to show that the Autobots were captured. As this was going down, Lennox was in the middle of leading his team to the river, where they rendezvoused with Epps and his group as well as a team of Navy SEALs. They were unable to cross the bridge until Dutch was able to lower it remotely. Once on the other side of the river, Ness set up an ambush to attack a group of Decepticons including Shockwave. As Lennox and his team parachuted down to get the drop on the Decepticons, Epps ordered the snipers to blind the cons. Stone would then order Demo Team to use the Bot Busters in order to immobilize the Decepticons. As this was happening, Lennox's parachute got caught on Shockwave. 
As he got to safety, Zimmerman attempted a Decepticon head kill shot, which didn't end up killing Shockwave but severely damaged him, causing him to fling Zimmerman off of him. As Lennox got Zimmerman out of harm's way, Epps and his team would open fire on Shockwave, forcing him to retreat. As Nesta launched their attack on the remaining Decepticons, the space bridge process was temporarily halted by Optimus's strike on the control pillar. As Sentinel engaged Optimus in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Tomahawks from earlier finally arrived shooting down several Decepticon fighters, giving Optimus the cover he needed to fight Sentinel. During all this, Dylan Gold was able to make his way to the control pillar, and was able to reactivate it while Sam struggled to stop him. Epps, Lennox, and the other soldiers were unable to provide assistance as they were heavily engaged in fighting the remaining Decepticon forces, but as soon as Sam successfully took down Gold, Epps, Lennox, and the other soldiers arrived on the scene. Epps urgently called for Bumblebee and Ratchet, who then destroyed the pillar, causing the partially formed Cybertron trying to implode and collapse in on itself. Following the battle, Lennox, Epps, and the rest of the Nest soldiers walked out on a bridge where Optimus had defeated both Megatron and Sentinel, celebrating a well-deserved victory. Just like in Egypt and in Los Angeles, a human Autobot alliance was the way to go when the world needed to be saved from the Decepticons. From here, we now move on to the events between Dark of the Moon and Age of Extinction, and here things were not looking too good for Nest. In the aftermath of the Chicago War, public opinion against all Transformers grew considerably, and thus the United United States government officially decommissioned the Nest program and replaced it with Cemetery Wind a CIA-run operation that would continue Nest's mission of hunting down Decepticons. A handful of Nest personnel would end up joining the organization, but I plan to cover this event in greater detail in both my Fall of Public Perception and Birth of Cemetery Wind videos respectively. Now regarding the exact date of Nest decommissioning, we unfortunately don't have a precise date. However, according to the events described in Age of Extinction, following the Battle of Chicago, a swift act of Congress ended all joint operations between the military and the Autobots. It can therefore be assumed that Nest was shut down no later than a month after the Chicago War, placing their deactivation in October 2013. Now, as for what happened to the majority of Nest personnel, we can assume that they either retired since Epps would go back into retirement sometime after the events of Dark of the Moon, or alternatively went back to the branch of military they originated from. Since by the time the last night rolls around, we see that Lennox went back to working for the United States Army Rangers, which was the branch he served under before forming Nest. Besides this speculation, not much is known about what Nest and its other personnel were up to. However, during the events between Age of Extinction and The Last Night, the deeds of Cemetery Wind were eventually exposed to the world and the organization was replaced by the Transformers Reaction Force, whose actions were more US government authorized. It also appears that during this time, Nest was reactivated, since when the events of Transformers of The Last Night unfolded, the old Nest base at the Pentagon was still being used. However, the unit was heavily restricted on what they could do, appearing to be only able to be used for UCAV and general surveillance operations in order to help aid the TRF. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a clear date as to when they were reactivated. However, we do know that Age of Extinction takes place in May 2018, since Harold Attinger tells us that the Battle of Chicago happened five years ago. And we know it's the month of May since Tessa only has two weeks of school left. As we know, Cemetery Wind's deeds would be exposed to the world, prompting the TRF to be formed the same year. And since we see Nest working with the TRF during the events of The Last Night, we can assume that they were reactivated around the same time the TRF was formed, likely in mid to late 2018. Now from here, I would like to cover the vehicles and special gear Nest used. In Revenge of the Fallen, Nest had a handful of vehicles. To transport the Autobots around the globe, they used Boeing C-17A Globemaster 3s. For human transport, Bell UH-1 Iroquois, Boeing AH-64 Apache Longbows, and Sikorsky UH-60 Blackhawks were good for the air, while modified 2008 Hummer HXs and 2009 Hummer H3Ts armed with cannons were used to engage enemies. While 2008 Can-Am Spiders that were transported in the trailers of Max CH Series trucks and in Globemaster 3s were used to get around. Nest also had access to Sector 7's heavily modified Chenov Desert Patrol vehicles, but they were not used in combat. As for some of the gear they used, all Nest soldiers would be equipped with Quantum Crypto gear. Moving on to Dark of the Moon, Nest would add a few new ground vehicles to their arsenal, such as AM General HMM WVM1025s, Oshkosh M1075 PLSs, and Oshkosh MTVRs. 
four aircraft, they would acquire a modified V-22 tandem that was larger and had four rotors, Boeing CH-47 Chinooks, General Atomics MQ-1C Gray Eagles, Boeing AH-64D Apache Longbows, Bell CV-22 Ospreys, a Gulfstream Aerospace G-450, and the Rockwell Space Shuttle Discovery OV-103. And lastly, as for some of the gear they used, some Nest soldiers would be equipped with portable Energon detectors. Others would be equipped with bot busters which were similar to the Boomstick's Wheeljack made, and all Nest soldiers would be equipped with piercing D-Bot, specialized ammunition that was made to take down Decepticons. Now from here, I would like to dive into the many logos and patches Nest had. And well, in Revenge of the Fallen, their logo was a bull skull with wings. However, for Dark of the Moon, their logo would be updated to a skull surrounded by three prongs. This logo would have several variants that Nest soldiers would sport as patches. Something you probably did not know was that the patch design Lennox exported was a combination of the old and new Nest logo. Another patch variant was this one of a sword, which is definitely an homage to the Revenge of the Fallen patch that had Nest's iconic motto on it. Furthermore, there was another nest patch, but it wasn't as cool. It was just a black end surrounded by a green background. Speaking of the color green, another cool patch would be the one Agent Graham and Hooch had, which was lime green and appears to say Nest Special Forces or Special Program on it. However, I'm not too sure which one it's supposed to be due to the quality of the photo. Now, there is one last Nest logo you probably haven't seen or even known existed. That would be this one that just says Nest in gray font. This logo was reserved for the engineers at Nest who worked on the various vehicles. Now, the last thing I want to cover before ending off this video is the history behind what the acronym for NEST stands for. Though we call it and know it by the name the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty, this name for the organization was not mentioned in any of the films, with it only being called by its acronym. Different meanings for the acronym have been offered by different sources. On an LG promotional tie-in website, the group was called the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Team. While on Hasbro and Akara's websites, in addition to the Veiled Threat novel, NEST stood for Networked Elements Supporters and Transformers. A mouthful, I know. However, NEST being known as the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty originates from the Revenge of the Fallen storybook, The Last Prime. And this name for the group has been used ever since, appearing in IDW's various Dark of the Moon comics, the Transformers classified novel series, and of course, Transformers The Ride 3D. And just like that, now you know the history of the Non-Biological Extraterrestrial Species Treaty. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you have not already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say thank you to all my wonderful Patreons and channel members for supporting the channel. You guys are the reason why Theorymus has continued to get bigger and better, so a big fat thank you to all of you. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving a like rating because it does help the channel a lot. With that said, hit that outro. Thank you.